comments. Um, so just a few notes I made to myself this morning, because usually I make announcements at the beginning of lecture. Um, one is I personally sign off at 8 p.m. from my computer and I don't turn it on again. And I, I usually don't go on before eight o'clock in the morning. You guys can send me, you guys are all sending me emails at one in the morning, but um, I mentioned that because somebody I noticed last night signed into like Zoom at eight o'clock at night. And I don't know if it was somebody who I did not have before. Um, I know Bernadette used to say, oh, anytime I see somebody signed in, I'll check in. Well, Bernadette came over yesterday and she told me she's never going to do that again. That was a disaster for her. Um, and so um, I, I will be in office hours from 11 till 1 and in the evening from 6 until like 7.30. Last night I was there a little bit past 7.30. So if somebody's in there and we're going through stuff, I will stay. Um, there was also somebody who said they tried to sign into office hours last night and I never allowed them in. And I don't know if it's when I start sharing the screen that I can't hear the doorbell. So if that happens, um, there was also somebody last term that happened with, and it turned out they were signed into the wrong um, office hour. So since we have two different office hours, sometimes that could be, or just be patient. Uh, and I am going to have Friday office hours for sure, because you guys have stuff due on Friday. So they will be normal time, 11 till one, and then six o'clock till seven. Um, there is no lecture on Friday. But I will have office hours on Friday. Somebody pointed out on the syllabus, um, it actually just said Monday through Thursday. And I didn't really, I thought I had fixed that. Um, and, and that's my attempt at drawing me meditating at eight o'clock at night, an ideal of going to sleep, which didn't work last night. Um, I have to figure out how to get the exam format to work. And so I'll be emailing you probably this weekend. Um, just real quick, because a couple of people have asked, it will be half show your, probably half-ish show your work and half multiple choice. Um, the multiple choice will be open during the day. So that will be like, say for one, you'll have a one hour time limit and that will be on your blackboard. So it will time you in and, and it will end. Like, and it's probably the format most of you use like with Bernadette and with Dr. Whitman. Um, and then the other hour will have a designated time, two different times during the day, which would probably be office hour time um, that you would come to do the written part. Um, and that way I'm available to answer questions and we can fine tune that um, on Monday. But so there will be a show your work section. In the past, I always did all show your work. Um, and last term, I've always done all show your work. I'm not a huge fan, but we'll negotiate a little bit with that and fine tune it. Um, and so if you have suggestions or questions, just please ask. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna go back to my first page. So I'm gonna go back to the first page because I wanna go back to make sure you've got um, some of these terminology down. Um, a comment I don't remember mentioning yesterday, alkali, alkaline is another word for base. That was actually the classic uh, word for base. Whenever you see that prefix AL, it is actually an alchemical word. So it's, um, I believe it's an Arabic designation. So AL, like algebra actually comes from all that too, an alchemist. Um, so alkali was the AL in front of potassium because um, potassium in water makes potassium hydroxide, which is a base. Uh, I have a little video that I did PowerPoint where I talk about some of the properties of the acids and bases. But I think the big ones, you all know that acids have a pH below seven and the lower the pH, the more acidic. And bases have a pH above seven. Um, and the higher the pH, the more alkaline it is. The other comment with that is it's assuming you're at 25 degrees Celsius. I don't know who designated 25 degrees Celsius because that would be your house without air conditioning. 
25 degrees Celsius is a really warm room. Um, they're actually changing that number now, which is a little bizarre, um, but it is what is considered standard temperature. Gas laws, standard temperature was zero degrees, which is the only place it's zero degrees. Go ahead, Alexander. Um, yesterday you mentioned that the, for the pH scale, it can go above or below what we're normal or what we know. Yeah, go does ahead. That, you, did, go ahead. Yeah, uh, does that occur in nature or is that a man-made thing that we reach those? It has to be. So when it happens, I don't know if anybody else pondered this, and so thank you for doing that, is if you have an extremely concentrated solution. So if you have an, a strong acid in which the solution has a concentration of 10, so a concentration of 10 will give you a pH of negative one um, yeah. because you're negative log of 10, right? However log base works. Um, I don't know if in nature HCl can ever be found that concentrated. Um, our stomach pH is a pH of two. I don't know if there's anywhere, there might be some weird place they find it. Um, and so same thing, if you had like NaOH that had a concentration higher than one molar, you would actually um, have a pH higher than 14. I don't know if that happens actually anywhere in nature, but there is that weird phenomena that is quantum that if we look for it, we'll find it. Mm -hmm. So just the fact that you asked the question, you're gonna find it now somewhere on the internet. And okay. it may have not even been there 10 minutes ago, but now it's there. It's, um, is, there is there a reason to have that uh, high and low uh, amount? Like, is there no. like a cleaning aspect or anything to have that? No, Drano, range? if you guys, um, when you do that pH lab, if you have Drano, Drano is going to be the thing that will give you the yellow color, the highest pH, because um, it's straight NaO, it's, NA, it's concentrated NaOH. Mm -hmm. uh, the advantage, yeah, it will be, ex it will be very cleaning, but it's going to be very caustic. So if you're, you could have other issues that come up from it. Um, okay. When we, we used to make soap in lab, which would be a fun demo for somebody to do if, if they want to try and make soap at home and videotape or if, um, take pictures of themselves making it. Um, you use either KOH or NaOH, pure KOH and pure NaOH. So you have to wear gloves, you have to wear goggles, uh, you take serious precautions. Anybody who makes soap in their garage, like my neighbor makes it for me and she's wearing the whole, you know, the big apron and everything. Um, in, yeah, acids are extremely useful, like they've etched glass with it and stuff. So I guess it would just be that they're extremely useful in that high concentration. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. And actually for the rest of you, my, if you have a question, just push your space bar and you can start talking and it should pull you up. Right now I can only see four of you. Um, I don't actually know how many people are here, but it's just how the screen shows it. Uh, I want to review organic acids. You'll see carbons and hydrogens can be any amount. So we show X and Y. And I don't like my colored pen. Uh, and then you'll see CO2H. So it's that CO2H that tells you it's an acid. And it's this hydrogen after the, the two oxygens. So the oxygen's greed for electrons allows the hydrogen to be pulled off. These other hydrogens, whenever hydrogens are attached to carbon, they are neutral because it's a nonpolar bond and it doesn't come off. Um, same here when we get to organic, just means carbon hydrogen based. A couple of people were telling me they're gonna take organic chemistry. Again, this has no effect, but the, the combination with the nitrogen, that nitrogen's gonna have a lone pair of electrons. Um, and we'll see that when we do the reactions on the next page. That is a base. This one's an acid. And it's because this lone pair of electrons is going to attract a hydrogen. And again, that's, that's the definition of a base, is it attracts or accepts um, protons. So attracts or accepts. Uh, and using the word proton is a hydrogen ion where an acid donates 
protons. Uh, monoprotic just means one proton, polyprotic is multiple. Uh, amphiprotic is actually important. And I showed this yesterday with a different example, but H2O is actually the classic example. Um, so you, you don't have to write this down. You can just kind of follow along and go, okay, if you combine H2O with an acid like HCl, the HCl is the acid, so the H2O has to be the base. So in this case, the hydrogen is going to move over to the acid, to the H2O. Uh, when H2O is mixed with NH3, the NH3 is the base, so the H2O is the acid. I always label my acid, I try to always underneath it. So in this case, the hydrogen is going to move over to the nitrogen. Um, and so that's an example of something that's amphiprotic, depending on what it's mixed with. Uh, there are very few things that are actually amphiprotic. So like my example up here, this is an acid. It cannot accept another hydrogen. There's nowhere for it to accept it. And we'll probably see examples um, on other pages or when we look at the study set. All right. Conjugate just means the pair. So finishing in this equations up here, uh, just real quick, see if you remember. The arrows are actually important. That with the HCl, I only show one arrow, but when I combined it with the NH3, I do the equilibrium arrows. So does anybody remember why I do them different? Go ahead, HCl Harrison. HCl is a strong acid, so it only can go one way. And then NH is a weak base, so it can have an equilibrium. Yeah. So the strong acids are one, one way. So it's one arrow. And it was a question that Aaron had asked me earlier. Um, he had asked me if we're gonna be doing any limiting reactant problems, and we actually do do them next week. Because um, whenever we react something with a strong acid or a strong base, we don't do equilibrium chemistry, we do one-way reactions. Um, and that's next week after the midterm, so we don't have to worry about it. Weak acids and bases, are two ways, and the reason for that is because they only partially dissociate. So they, they don't fully give up, I spelled that wrong, sorry. Um, <laughs> they, they only partially, they're, they, they're holding on to their hydrogen or they're only attracting a small amount. Uh, and it is a very partial, it's like less than 1%. Um, maybe up to 5%. And I gave a list yesterday of the strong acids. Again, the list changes depending on where you look. Uh, HCl, HBr, HI, nitric acid, H2SO4, sulfuric acid, just the first hydrogen, this is a polyprotic, and HClO4. And we'll talk about that one later. So what happens on this is the H2O is gonna pick up a hydrogen and become H3O. The base becomes the conjugate acid. Um, so they're a pair and the acid becomes Cl negative, which is called the conjugate base. So an acid becomes a conjugate base. They differ by, as this says, they differ by one proton. In the second example, the H2O gives up the hydrogen, so it becomes hydroxide, which is the conjugate base, and the nitrogen picks up the hydrogen. We show the hydrogens after nitrogens when we write them, and yeah. Oh, that would be my conjugate acid. That's just a quick review from yesterday, and some of the terminology. On Monday, I will be doing, going over the practice exam that I'll post this weekend, um, and, and we might see some of these words show up. Questions before I turn my page? All right, so we're gonna look at some acid-base reactions, and I did A and B yesterday, so we're gonna look at C. H2O, um, K 
can be an acid or base. So you always look at the other one to figure out what it is. And as soon as you see the nitrogen, you're going, that's a base. Nitrogens love to be a base. That makes the H2O an acid. You don't have to do this little circle thing that I do. I do it as a teaching aid to make sure everybody's following what's going on, but one hydrogen moves over. And this would be um, why this example is here. I mentioned it already. Nitrogen is what picks up the hydrogens. The mistake a lot of students will make here is they'll put the hydrogen up here with the carbon. But again, carbons and hydrogens, that's a nonpolar bond. That's totally different chemistry than what we're doing here. Uh, one or two arrows? Two. Because it's weak. You don't see one of the six strongs. You don't see like NaOH and KOH are going to be the only strong bases we see. There are six classic strong bases, but we're not going to go there. All right, so C6H5, and then the NH is now NH3 because it picked up a hydrogen. And the charge always changes. If you pick up a hydrogen, it becomes positive. If you lose a hydrogen, you're going to change your charge down by one. The charges are a hard thing for some students. Some of you just get it. Um, a comment I can make to you that might help. The total of your charges have to be equal on the two sides. So on my reactant side, I have no overall charge. It's zero. And on my product side, I have a positive one and a minus one, which means, again, zero. Um, all right, we have to label conjugate acid. So the base becomes a conjugate acid acid becomes a conjugate base. Two arrows. Uh, all right, the next one. Real quick, this guy is amphiprotic. You don't need to label that, but it's a teaching tool for me why I wrote this question. It has a hydrogen, so it could act as, as an acid, but because it has the negative charge, it can accept the hydrogen. It is going to be the base because the HI is not just an acid, it is a strong acid. And in fact, if you see one of the six strong acids, um, because of the situation that you're, we're in, I would make a little note card and have those six strong acids there. So whenever you see them, you just say SA and you know it is one arrow. And so this hydrogen is going to combine with that other hydrogen. And this is why I like to circle it and put it over so you make sure you move the correct hydrogen. And this is now going to be H2PO4. So my question, what is my charge on that going to be? Negative one. Just a negative one. So it was a negative two, picks up a positive, so it's a negative one. And then the HI, the high, becomes just I with a negative. So this is what I was saying. The total charges are the same on the two sides. On my reactant side, I have a total charge of negative two. And over here, I have negative one, negative one, which is total of negative two. It's just charges distribute different. All right. Which one is my conjugate acid? The H2PO4 is the conjugate acid because the base becomes conjugate acid. Whatever is your acid becomes your conjugate base. All right. I'm going to do one more and then I have one more step I have to do with these. Now, this is a question that comes up in the lab that you guys have to do today on Le Chatelier's. Uh, and it, it actually was not about sodium. It was about the NO3. I think it's on the very first on section A. And it says, what happened to the NO3? Why isn't it shown in the equation? Um, it's the same with the sodium. Nitrates and sodiums are always spectator ions. Just remember that word from way back in Chem 221? Spectator ions, they always just float around in the solution, aimlessly wandering. They have no interest in anything. 
my recommendation is you just cross them out. They have no impact. Sodium, the 1As have no impact on any of this acid-base stuff. But when you cross them out, you want to add the charge. So now you're going to have a negative charge on each of those. I will show you also if you want to keep them in there, but it's actually easiest to cross them out. All right. Oh. Um, this is an evil question. I will say that to myself also. They're both amphiprotic. They both have hydrogen. And they both had a sodium, meaning they had a place that the hydrogen could come in and knock out the sodium. So they both have the ability to act as the acid base. So how do we know which one's which? You know those charts on the last two pages? We got to go to that chart. I'm going to go to the one on page 18 because it's actually easier to use um, for this purpose. And we have to look up the Ka values for these two species. So looking at that chart, you would find the H2PO4, which is not far from the top. Uh, you want to find it under the acid column, and then we have to find the HCO3. So the HCO3 negative is towards the bottom. It's Ka is 4.8 e to the negative 11. And the H2PO4 is about halfway down, and it is 6.2 e to the negative 8. So before I go on, questions about that chart and finding these numbers. The good news is on like your midterm and stuff, you'd be given a really small chart with just like four things on there. So it'll be really easy to find pieces. So the Ka tells you how strong the acid is. So which of those two is stronger? This, this, can be a conundrum for some students because we're working with negative exponents. The H2PO4 is the larger number. 6.2 e to the negative 8 is a larger number than 4.8 e to the negative 11. So the H2PO4 is, it's not a strong acid, it is stronger because it has, whoops, has a larger Ka. This is a question you will see. It comes up on the last page of our notes. It shows up in your homework. It shows up on the final. It's going to show up on your midterm. It shows up on the review next week. Um, and those of you taking organic chemistry, it shows up the first day of organic chemistry. Uh, in fact, at some universities, the very first day of organic chemistry, you take a test. And if you don't pass the test, you're not allowed to be in the class. Because I've had students email me back and they're like, I got the highest score because it's about KAs and we had just done KAs in our class. So whichever one, if you have, if it's a choice, like on D, HI is an acid. And like on C, that's a base. But if this happens, you pick the stronger acid is the acid. The other one is the base. It is double arrows because Neither one was the obvious um, strong acid. And then the acid gives up just one of its hydrogens. So it's now going to be HPO4 with a negative 2, because it had a negative 1. And the HCO3 is going to pick up a, car a hydrogen, sorry, and it becomes H2CO3. I'm laughing at myself because this is, um, I usually have the board and I get to write lots of good stuff on there. All right, so the HPO4 negative 2 is the conjugate base. Acid becomes base. And then the base um, bicarbonate becomes the conjugate acid. All right, we're not done yet. But questions. Now, this is a hard question. Um, if you saw something like this on your test, this is like, it would be one question. And I don't know that I've ever had a question like this on the exam, but you would look at the Ka values. Usually it's a question where you're just comparing Ka's and I just ask you which one's stronger and you pick the one with the higher Ka. Uh, there is one more step to this 
question. And it is something I talked about in the acidosis slideshow. You may or may not have noticed it. And it is carbonic acid. You should have learned this back in 221 when you did net ionic equations. Carbonic acid is an unstable compound and it breaks down into H2O and CO2. And so you did this experiment as kids, right? You take an acid and you add it to carbonic or to baking soda, you get bubbles, you make a volcano with different colors and stuff. Anyway, that would be a cool demo. Try all different acids, see the best volcano. So this is going to break down into H2O and CO2. So you can, I always write it as carbonic acid and then I'll write those above or below it or next to it. A question that usually comes up at this point, somebody will say, well, which one's the conjugate acid? It's probably the CO2, but to me, as long as you're just writing it under, you can put it under both of them. Um, all right, we have one more step, believe it or not. So again, if you have a question, just push your space bar and start talking. Um, I'm gonna go back up to A and B and fill in my answers just because I need it for my next teaching point. But I did these yesterday on the first one. Um, this is a strong acid, so it's a one-way reaction. So on D and A, if you have a strong, strong acid, if you have a one-way reaction, you're done. You label your conjugate base, your conjugate acid. Um, if it's not a strong acid, you have a two-way reaction. I did this on yesterday. And it means there's one more step. And it is up here. I said, write a balanced equation, identify your acid base, which are your reactants conjugate acid, conjugate base. And then I'm going to ask you to predict if it favors the forward or reverse. And so there are three steps you go through for the prediction. The first step is if a strong acid, it's one way. So you're done. There's no prediction needed. Your arrow already answered the question. But if it's a two-way reaction, then you're going to look for hydronium or hydroxide. So the rule here to determine which direction is favored is reactions always favor um, stronger to weaker. So again, if you have a strong, it's an easy one because the strongs always win. Um, in the list, you have the six strong acids and number seven is hydronium or hydroxide. So if we don't see a strong acid, so A and D we took care of, we look for hydronium or hydroxide. So on questions B and C, we're good. It means it favors the reverse you're gonna go away from the hydronium or hydroxide. So you would just, you can write it like that. You can write the arrow after and say favors the reverse. Some students will actually put a second arrow underneath their double arrows and say favors the reverse. So that would be examples B and C. And then we get to example E. E is the conundrum. We don't have a strong acid. We don't have hydronium or, uh, hydronium or hydroxide. So what are we gonna look for? Any thoughts? You all know the answer because you should have that handy chart in front of you. Remember that chart we pulled out? It has KAs, so then you have to, the real answer for all of this, there is one answer, which is you look at KA values.
but it's specifically, you're looking at the Ka for the acid versus the conjugate acid. Labeling is important. So we already have this piece here. So now we have to look up the H2CO3 because that's what we call the conjugate acid. So we look on our chart and it gets a Ka 4.2 times 10 to negative 7, e to negative 7. Conjugate acid is stronger. So this one wins. The stronger acid pushes harder. That's what it means to be stronger. You're pushing. So this is actually going to go reverse. You always go away from the strong. The strong wants to donate more. So it's pushing the reaction. A really good question that somebody often will ask me, usually in a couple days, is they say, well, what about looking at KBs? Sure, you could do the same thing. The stronger acid and the stronger base are always on the same side of the equation. So if you compared the KB um, of the base to the KB of the conjugate base, the conjugate base in this example would also win. The strongers are always on the same side. It has to do with how the math would work out. Um, which I'm not going to go through, but I always just look at the acids because it's much easier. Um, this chart, the very last page, the chart, the columns show you actually it goes from strong to weak acid. It's not a complete chart. There's huge charts you can find, I'm sure, on Google. Um, I mentioned this yesterday. Ka values are like a uh, hand waving, they're approximate, they're not ex uh, exact. That's why they're always two sig figs. And if you go on Google, you might find slightly different values. So we're gonna go with the charts I gave you so that we all have the same values so we don't go crazy saying, I had a student one year and he kept going on Google. And so that's why I give you the chart so we all have the same numbers. Um, yeah, and we'll come back and look at this chart later. Is there questions from A through E? All right. So you're going to be thrilled when we get to the math. Um, but the bottom of this page is really crucial. So F, G, H, and I, these are like those multiple choice type problems. And you all know them. You all learn this, in, like in my class, in the first, second week of 221. What are the 1A? What is the family? You know, your periodic table? Yes. Those of you who had me way back when, do you still have your hot pink periodic table from when we used to like actually be real people and meet in person? But the 1A family is called the alkali metals. You guys all remember hearing that? And the 2As were called the alkaline earth metals. And they are called that because they noticed many years ago that they form bases. They form alkaline solutions. So whenever you see, like here, I'm going to skip to G and H, or I'm sorry, G and I. If you have a metal and you put it in water, you are going to make a base, an alkaline solution. Metals, and this is not metal, a pure metal, when you put it into water, you're going to end up with um, an alkaline solution. If you take a non-metal and you put it in water, you're going to end up with an acidic solution. And I have next to it the little examples. We actually did I already up here with H2O and CO2 when they combine, which is in champagne or soda, um, you get carbonic acid. And then when you release the pressure, the CO2 comes off. But um, looking at I, NO2 and H2O would combine and we'd get HNO3 probably, more than likely, which would be an acid. Sodium and water would combine and we'd get NaOH, we'd get a hydroxide. My equations are not balanced. Um, you would also get hydrogen gas bubbles. You can balance. We're not, I'm not worrying about balancing right now. We got a lot to cover today. All right. 
that that is these these two pieces are a big point metals when you put them in water that is why we call the one a's and the two a's alkaline uh, non-metals when you put them in water they form acidic solutions and that is the whole thing about acid rain um, socks comes from coal uh, there is no such thing as clean coal all coal has sulfur in it and when you um, heat the coal to get rid of the sulfur it combines with water vapor in the air and you get sulfuric acid nox just comes from there's nitrogen and oxygen in the air whenever there's a lot of electricity from lightning or like the max going down the street you get nitric acid basically um, all right let's change colors uh here to f If you take a metal plus an acid, so magnesium plus HCl, we would get magnesium chloride plus hydrogen gas. Again, my equation's not balanced, but that's all it's saying is you're gonna make hydrogen gas bubbles. Um, and then here on H, H and G kind of go together. Calcium oxide plus water, you're gonna make calcium hydroxide. Again, metals and metal oxides, you're gonna form a base, alkaline. So we'll put those two together. Um, you will probably see this question in the multiple choice. Your test is timed, your final is timed. Um, so I mentioned that because we're in this environment where you, you know you can get in this lax state of oh i just have to copy everything you you're going to have a time limit and so you want to think and you want to think about it logically the one a's and two a's are called alkaline metals because they form bases so that would mean the non-metals would be the opposite they form the acids which is the acid rain and again i talk about it in my video i don't know if people watch it but um it's not a huge problem here as much as it is in industrial areas. So like the Midwest, like Ohio. Um, I know like I saw Paul Revere's tomb when I was a young gal and you guys cannot. His tombstone was marble and so you can't read it anymore. It's completely um, obliterated by the acid rain outside of Boston. All right, I'm gonna move on. Page 13. My comment for you, I'm gonna go through this page rather fast. Um, we talked about A and B yesterday. My answers are there. On C, if you tried it, most people get C wrong and they tell me my answer is wrong. It should be 11.40. Uh, there are two hydroxides in this problem. So, I'm going to go through a little bit of magic here because several people have asked me questions for every one mole of barium hydroxide there are two moles of hydroxide i'm going through this here i think harrison you may have asked me last night um, and some other people looking at the first worksheet and I commented mole to mole ratio that was using a balanced equation but this would be what I mean when I say show your work if it's not a show your work problem you can do it in your head and say oh well I have twice as much hydroxide so I must have a 0 0.0050 zero moles per liter or molarity is my hydroxide concentration I need that number so you have a choice here. And I honestly don't care which way you go. You're each gonna gravitate towards one way or the other. You can either change your hydroxide to hydronium and then your hydronium to pH. And the way you would do that, I'm not gonna go through it, I'm gonna just remind you of the formulas. Um, 
Again, this is all formula driven. So you're gonna always state your formula on show your work. Uh, you would do that formula, remember we talked about yesterday, hydronium times hydroxide equals 10 to negative 14. That is true at a temperature of 25 degrees. It's an assumption we make. Our bodies are not at 25 degrees, we're at 37 degrees Celsius. That's why our neutral pH is actually slightly alkaline, which is a good thing. Anyway, so that's how I would do the first step. And then once I find my hydronium, I would do pH equals negative log of the hydronium. The favor I have to ask you, when you show your work on a show your work problem, state the formula when you use it. So students like to regurgitate everything at the very beginning. And then it's like, so tell me as you're using it step by step, hey, this is the formula I'm using. Pretend like you're the teacher and everybody's trying to follow along. So you can do it that way. I personally actually do it the other pathway that I'm gonna show you. You get the same answer both ways. And over the next week, you're gonna each gravitate towards one path or the other. And it doesn't matter. The other way you can do it is you can do the negative log of the hydroxide. What does that equal? Does anybody remember what that term is? POH. That is called the POH. And I commented, nobody really uses the POH, but it is really useful. Yeah, of course. Sorry if you guys listening. Somebody sent me a message two minutes into my teaching and said, oh, I'm coming over. Um, all right, and then once you find the POH, there is a trick where you just do pH plus POH equals 14. I personally go that path because I can look really smart on the board and almost do it all in my head. You're going to have to put her outside. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, you can solve doing that. Um, and that's actually, I'm going to walk you through the two paths down here. You can do, again, pH plus pOH equals 14. So you can solve for pH. And then you can do 10 to negative pH equals your hydronium. A reminder in chemistry, we actually talk about is hydronium ion. It's never actually just a proton because it's the water that pulls it off. So this would be my step one, my step two. So that's the way I would do it to get to that answer. Your other pathway is you could do 10 to the negative pOH. And again, you don't have to do it both ways. I'm mentioning this, play with it so you feel comfortable with these formulas, because most of what we do is on the next two pages. You can take 10 to the negative pOH, and that equals your hydroxide. So remember that little p? That little p in front of anything, that little p means negative log. So if it's in front of OH, it means negative log of the hydroxide. And the way you get rid of the little p, the way you get rid of a log, is you do the opposite function. You do 10 to the power of the p, and that gets rid of the p, and now you're back to the hydroxide. So if you're given, this, this gets rid of the p, and this is how you create the p. So here, I'm getting rid of it. I'm changing it to the hydroxide. Then you would do hydronium times hydroxide equals 10 to negative 14. And this is actually quite fascinating to me as a teacher. What I find is um, every year I've done this, about half of you will go this path and you will just always stick to it. And about half of you will always go this path. And I, it's just, you just become comfortable and just stay with it. And just as long as you state the path you're using, and it's also more as you guys, because you guys created a study group, which is 
amazing. I'm so proud of you all for doing that. Um, just recognize in the study group, and that's why you're going to always state your formulas so that I can see which pathway you followed. And also, if somebody else is working with you, and, and if you don't like their path, just say, mm, I don't go that pathway. Um, it's the final answer I'm looking forward to. All right. So play with it. My answers are correct. I highly recommend that you do these problems. And then, of course, the study said I give you the answer key. And I will have office hours on Friday. We're going to do pages 14 and 15 are the big pages. So page 13 is so we can do page 14. Oh, I wrote out all my work. All right. I think I did A yesterday. All right, we'll look at B, look at that, I can cover it up. Uh, this formula at the top is really important. K is an equilibrium, um, and I talked about it yesterday. Just a reminder, KB, if you know KA, you just wanna know this, and if you do the homework, if every time you use KA, you write this expression, by the time you get with done with the homework, this is gonna be in your brain. You're gonna know it like you know, like the back of your hand or whatever they say, which I really don't know mine that well. All right, you also know KB. So as long as you know KA, you know KB, because KB is the opposite, meaning instead of hydronium, you would write hydroxide, right? So the yin versus the yang. Instead of conjugate base, you would write conjugate acid, instead of WA, which stands for weak acid, you would write weak base. All right, really quick, yesterday when I did it, and you're gonna see me when I do it, I usually flip these two at the top, it doesn't matter which one you write first because it's multiplying. So, Question A is an acid, you have to use Ka. Question B, see nitrogen. You guys see nitrogen, what are you thinking? Well, if you're not thinking base, hopefully you're going, oh, it's a base. Right there it says Kb, and B means base. So the first thing you wanna do is write your Kb expression. All right, Kb equals, so state your expression. And then we'll go through solving it. I should have printed this page again, which is, again, you can write it either direction, hydroxide times conjugate acid or conjugate acid times hydroxide equals your weak base. All right, in this chapter, these two numbers on top, I talked about it yesterday in the video, these two are always the same for this. Next week that will change, but that's after the midterm. Um, and so we'll worry about it after the midterm. So this number is my base. I gave you the KB. So our setup would just be, you state the formula, 1.8 e to the negative five equals x squared. Everybody ends up loving, they go, oh, it's an x squared problem. You're gonna become really good at x squareds basically over the next 24 hours. I know it's a short time frame, but you get it, and then you take your weekend, you can digest it, you can go back and practice, and then 0 0.025. Um, be careful with place values. You can put the zero before the decimal, I often leave it out. I don't, you can analyze why I do that. You're gonna go through rearranging, so you'll multiply by the 0 0.025. Depending on your algebra, come to office hours if you need some help. Then you take a square root and you solve for x and you get this number. Um, and again, just in the interest of time. Yeah. When you solve for x, always, always, always tell me what your x is. Like up here, I was very badly behaved. 
I should have said X equals the hydronium in question A. I did on the board. This was just like my notes. Um, because like here, you just go right into pH. Here it equals the hydroxide. So we're not going to go straight into pH. If you do the negative log of your X, you don't get the pH, you're going to get what? The pOH. Thank you. Several of you, I saw you, your mouths. That's the problem with masks. I wouldn't be able to read all of your lips. All right. So negative log of that would give you the pH, and then you do the thing where you do pH plus pOH equals 4. Uh, pH plus pOH equals 14. And you'll get this. Um, yesterday, I did talk about percent ionization. I'm going to do it. Um, a reminder with this one, the percent is always the change over the initial equals the percent. On worksheet one, the very first question, you did initial times percent equals change. With this chapter, we just do change over initial. So in this case, it's the change is the X or the hydroxide over the weak base that we started with times 100%. You can write it the first way I wrote it. You can write it the second way. It has to do with how your brain works. All right. I'm going to go through this pretty fast because the next page I want to have time to spend on because that's um, it's more practice with this. But on question C, it's just like what we did, are we going to use the Ka or the Kb formula, and how do you know? Well, it tells you, hey, this is an acid, Ka equals this. So you would state your Ka formula. I wanted to point out something here because I'd hoped I hadn't done this, but I did. Um, Organic acids always have two oxygens. There's one exception, and it's phenol, P-H-E-N-O-L. Um, and it's because it has a benzene ring, which is flat, carcinogen. When it has the OH, because of the resonance, gets into a lot of stuff. Just accept, I gave you a Ka. It's a very weak acid. To be able to solve, this has to be molarity. That big M is moles per liter. I gave you grams. How do you change grams to moles? Oh, this periodic table. It's upside down. Periodic table. And then change your, that's what I was doing here. You're not gonna have time to, change, to check it, but I took my grams over my volume, changed my grams to moles. I got a molarity, I plugged in. You would have stated your Ka formula and I get my answer. Um, and then D, let's look at D. Let me do it on here. The thing with D is it wants you to find the Ka. Here we go. It wants you to find the Ka. So we have our Ka equals hydronium times the conjugate base over the acid. So this one, it's still the same formula. We're just solving for this side. Something I said to you when I started doing this page these two on top are always going to be the same in this chapter. That's why this first midterm is wonderful, because these two are the same. This point one will go in your denominator. And again, I recommend that you take the time, pause the video, and go ahead and try this. This, we're going to be plugging into the top. We can't plug it in directly. We're not wanting the pH there. We're wanting the hydronium. 
How do you change pH into H3O? Ten to the negative pH. Yeah, it's going back to this. If we take ten to negative, here it was pOH, ten to negative pH. So I just simply write it like this, ten to negative pH, and then I'm just going to square it because these two numbers are going to be the same, and then over the point one zero, and I plug it in, and you'll get my answer. Now, again, about half of you, depending on how you think about math, you'll just plug it in like I did. So you'll plug it in as 10 to negative 2.43, square it, and you'll do it all in one step. And some of you will wanna figure out what this number is. You'll like to show all of your steps. And that's fine, it just has to do with your math. And I know I went through that fast, but I'm assuming um, your lab for today is really not that bad. And so you want to make sure that you go through these notes and you start in your study set. Um, and it's actually not that bad of a study set. It's actually better than the first one. And again, be forgiving of yourself. If you're like, I need a day off, you lose a point for turning in your study set late. That's it. One point is not going to make or break you. Not doing your study set will. So if you turn in your study set by Tuesday, you lose a point. Or if you're like, I got my study set, but I'm gonna turn the worksheet in late, that's what happens. Um, but I will have office hours again tomorrow. All right, we got one more page. This is, unless there was any questions on that one. So let's do this. Ionic compounds, salts. This is different from what I talked about two, three pages ago when I said the metals are alkaline, alkaline metal, alkaline earth metals. That is when they are metals. That is when their protons and electrons are equal. In that first moment, everything's created, they turn into an ion. The word salt means ion. Uh, chemists just use the word salt. So a cation, right? You guys all learn cats have paws, they're positive. So on your syllabus, the top it said cation affirmation. You're writing something positive. That whole awesome. This is gonna be getting it done in five weeks. You don't have to dwell for 10 weeks. Hey, we're gonna be done in four weeks. <laughs> I know, all right. Cations are positive. So, 1As and 2A ions have no effect on pH. These are the ions. So remember the spectators, anytime you see a 1A or a 2A, we're gonna just cross them out. They don't affect pH. Um, all the others, so let's say we have cobalt or aluminum. All the rest, they are gonna be acidic. All right, uh, you could also have when nitrogen gains a hydrogen, it becomes positive. It also, that's a cation. The 1As and 2As, no effect. All the other cations are acidic. Simple enough. All right, anions, the ions, right? That's how they say it everywhere else, apparently. Um, if it's a conjugate base of a strong acid, they have no effect. And the reason for that is the strong acids are one-way reaction, so their conjugate bases can never react and go back. There is a way they can make them react, but we're not gonna go there. Um, so those would be the chloride, the bromide, the iodide, the nitrate. Remember the strong acids, ClO4 negative, 
All right. So that's step one. Step two, there's three steps here. Anions, cations are acids. Anybody want to guess what anions are going to be? Bases. Oh, one guess. They are going to be basic. Right, we're going to do examples in a moment. Uh, there is one other catch here, and we'll get to it in the last example. What if something is amphiprotic? If you get something that's amphiprotic, you go, yeah, 50-50 chance. Actually, you don't. Um, you compare the Ka. You do have a 50-50 chance. You compare the Ka and Kb. So like what we did, remember we did all those reactions way back? That was getting us ready for this. All right, so let's walk through the examples. Let's, I'm gonna walk through the first row. And let's get more in focus. Maybe. The trick, cross out the 1As. And the two A's. See the potassium? Cross it out. Uh, sodium? Cross it out. Because it doesn't, remember the solids and liquids we were crossing out? Same now. One A's and two A's. Cross them out. And conjugate bases of the strong acids. So ClO4 we cross out. Bromide we cross out. NO3 we cross out. Chloride we cross out. Whew. We get across a lot out, makes it really easy. So in the first example, if you cross them both out, you have neither an acid nor a base. This one is going to be neutral. Meaning pH of 7. Has no impact on pH. All right, if you are left with the cation, the iron, the ammonium, or the aluminum, these are all acids. So if you're left with the first ion, acid. If you're left with the anion, it's a base. All right, let's do the second row. So I'm gonna take a deep breath. You guys go ahead and try it. Cross out the ones you need to cross out and then label them. I'm gonna be right back. I have to turn my AC on. All right, those of you at home can pause me and keep going. We're in good shape. All right, magnesium. One A's and two A's we cross out. Sodium we cross out. Lithium we cross out. You do not cross out fluoride. Um, I'm gonna explain why after we get through this page. Calcium you cross out. That's it. Now we go back. Carbonate, I'm left with, so this is a base. Phosphate, I'm left with, this is a base. Fluoride, I'm left with, this is a base. Questions on those? All right, the last two are evil. You can go, oh, makes me. And that is because, oh, what are we left with? Remember this word? Amphiprotic. We're left with the frog, the amphibian. So there's for some reason, there was a joke one year in my class, we were left with the frog. So we're gonna have to use that chart that I'm using here. We look up HPO4 negative two, we look up a Ka for it, and we look up a Kb. So we have to find it as both the acid, it's pretty far down as an acid. You can trust that I can read my chart. 3.6 e to negative 13. For the base, you have to find it over here on the base column, HPO4. So here's HPO4 in the acid column. That's where I got that. And then as a base, it's right there. 
its KB is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 7. So which one wins? What's it going to be? Basic. It's going to be a base because the KB is larger. All right. So we'd say B. So if this was a show your work question, you would have to show me, I compared the KA and KB, or KB is greater than KA, and you'd write in your values there and say basic. If it's multiple choice, you'd have to look at your chart. All right, now the very last one. We didn't cross anything out. It does not make it neutral. It's only gonna be neutral if you cross them both out. So what are we gonna have to do? Oh, we have this chart. So the NH4, that's the acid. We look up its Ka. And it's right here, five point, sorry. Um, right there, 5.6 times 10 to negative 10. So we look up the Ka of this. And then for the fluoride, we look up its KB, and it's way up here, 1.4 e to negative 11, and we compare them. So the acid wins, so it's an acid. All right. Now we're going to do a little bit of math, and we do have one more page. So, calculating pH of salts. The last page of your homework is about salts, so you're going to have a question like this. Try it, and then look at my answer key, and then the ones you have questions on, highlight it. If you can't figure it out, that's why I have office hours tomorrow. And then there's always also Monday. And I'll have office hours before the exam opens up on Tuesday. So I have these little notes here for you. So you don't have to try and write down everything. Um, and num step one is actually key. On the previous page, it was obvious when we were working with an acid or base. It was a Ka or Kb problem. Um, that is the key here when we're working with a salt. You can only use one or the other. If it's an acid salt, like here, FeBr3, we need a Ka value. If we have magnesium carbonate, we have to use a Kb value. And then we go through all the stuff. So the problem is, this is how you're going to see problems given. It will say calculate the pH of the NH4Cl, and then it will give you the Kb, but this is an acid, because it's NH4, which is an acid. NH3 is a base. My question for you is, how are NH4 and NH3 related? Conjugate base pairs. They are, great, thank you, they're conjugate pairs. They differ by one hydrogen. So if we say NH3 is the base, this is the conjugate acid, or you can say NH4 is the acid, NH3 is the conjugate base. It doesn't matter. They're conjugate pairs. And that means we can do, it was on the previous page, but the Ka times the Kb, this is of conjugate pairs, is always equal to a magic number, which is 10 to negative 14. And if you really want to understand why, you can always ask me during office hours. There's sometimes one person. I can walk you through how the equations all come together. Um, it's like algebra geekiness. But if you know the Kb, you can change it to the Ka of its conjugate and vice versa. We do this a lot over the next two weeks.
that you're given the one and then we always seem to change it. And it's like, why do we do that? I, it's just how it's done. Um, and that is only true for conjugates. So what I did is I changed my KB to KA and then it's still an X squared problem. Now, my question, I solve for X. Oh, notice I labeled it correctly this time. You wanna always tell me what the X is, hydronium or hydroxide, and then I plug in. My comment for you guys, all of you at home watching, you would not get full credit for show your work here because I left out steps. <laughs> so your step one would be here that you would show that you changed from Ka, I'm sorry, from Kb to Ka. What is missing from step two is you want to show the formula. And some of you probably when I was making notes on your worksheet, um, and this always happens on the first worksheet, it's learning how to show your work fully. So you would want to go back and state, excuse me, this formula. It seems like, oh, I keep stating that formula. It's really good. It becomes second nature. And then you just become really proficient at these. So you're going to state that formula. It is an X squared over the concentration of the acid. You solve for X, you state what X is, and then you would have one more step. So step three is the negative log of our X is our pH. And so I would like show, okay, I plug that in and there it is. So I said arrows are really nice. Don't allow your arrows to crisscross because then I can't follow them. And then I'll ask, does the answer make sense? And all I'm looking for, really simple answer. Yes, it's an acid, pH is less than seven. I don't care how low it is, it's just less than seven. Because that salt was an acid. It's back to what we just did up there. So I'm gonna look at number two, because number two is how the homework is gonna have crazy wording. And then your worksheet has two of these. And this is why I'm having office hours tomorrow. And then you get your weekend and also Monday. And be forgiving of yourself if you're just like, I need a break. I'll write her a really nice poem with the lab and I'll get a bonus point. Or I'll draw an awesome cartoon. Or if it's Jessica or Brianna, you can play the ukulele for me. And a song about acids and bases. I had somebody last term sang me a song, sent me a YouTube video of them singing a gas law song. It was really fun. So you can say, okay, I'm gonna get next. I can, I'm gonna be late by a day and I'll just do something fun and creative to make up for it. So question number two, I wanna walk through this because this is more how they'll be worded. In the real world, you usually find things in their ionic form. Most drugs are acids or bases and they are stored, they are made as ionic form because salts are very stable. They have long half-lives, they have long shelf lives, uh, and they don't have a smell. Acids and bases stink. All right, propanoic acid is an acid. See the hydrogen, right? The CO2H, I circled my hydrogen. So I tell you it's a weak acid, there's the Ka. And then we're gonna make it into a sodium salt. It's an antifungal used by vets. Lovely. Um, so we're gonna find the pH of sodium propanoate. So the question is, what the heck is the formula of sodium propanoate? It's really simple. Take that hydrogen off and you're gonna put in place of it, sodium. So there it is. Sodium, there's the propanoate, or here, we can write it over here. So CH3, CH2, CO2. We take the H off, which had a positive, and we put a sodium on. I don't care if you put the sodium first or last. Um, it's going to be a 50-50. Half of you are going to do what I just did and put it at the end because you just pull the hydrogen off and put the sodium on there. Or... Some of you are like, no, I have to show the cation first, and that's great. And then there's always 
more than one of you, that says, why are you writing it like this? Because it's organic chemistry. Uh, and when you take organic chemistry, this makes sense. If you don't like how I wrote it, you can condense and say C3, H5, O2. Does that make sense? Um, to me, I'm a biochemist. This actually makes more sense. But you can combine the carbons, the hydrogens, and the oxygens. Um, the reason we write it this way is so you see the CO2H, so you know it's an acid. Right? That's my formula. Is this an acid or a base? It lost its hydrogen, so it's not an acid anymore. It is the conjugate base. Can we use Ka? It's not an acid. We're going to use Kb. How do we change Ka to Kb? This formula. What you're going to see me do is I do it like this. And about half of you will actually just revert to writing it like that. Well, 10 to negative 14 divided by the Ka. You would have stated your formula. I didn't write my formula. I did very badly. Your Kb formula, you would state the full thing. I don't, you can always pause the video and like, but try this at home. You have to go to molarity. That's my first step. Your second step, show your formula, conjugate acid over the base equals that. This is a base. That's going to be the number down there. I do my x squared. I solve. I state what my x is. And then negative log of the x is not that answer. It is the pOH. And then you change it to pH. So you can all pause the video and play with that and say, oh, great. OK, I got it. I feel good with this. I got this problem. It's one problem. I'm going to move on. Again, you guys can go back and pause, go to the end of the, towards the end of the video. Um, yeah, I'm going to have my office hours tomorrow, but no lecture time tomorrow. All right. And then there was a question somebody said, why don't I post my videos on Blackboard? You guys, if you go into Blackboard and click on YouTube, it takes you exactly to the page and you just click on the video. Um, or it does that for me. I don't know why it wouldn't do it for you. So I'm going to flip so we can move on. All right. I can go back at the end once I stop the video if you guys want me to go back to that. I want to look at the last page. We're not going to do any more math. Polyprotic. The only thing I want to mention about polyprotic, don't worry about this picture. We talk about it next week after the midterm. This picture is not on the midterm. Polyprotic, they give up one hydrogen at a time. So that this has three hydrogens. It has three different Ka values. The first one is a million times bigger than the second one. Actually, 100,000 times bigger. So anyway, that's what polyprotic means. We're not going to do the calculation. I'm going to briefly go over the rest of this page because it's actually important. Um, I, again, posted a video that I did with PowerPoint. It's an intro for your pH lab, but it also goes through some of these definitions. So you might want to listen. And also, I can't remember who asked. Um, I think Juliana may have asked me earlier, if you don't have a famous chemist yet, I mentioned six of them in that video that nobody has picked yet. I'm amazed. Um, and they're actually really big ones. They're pretty cool. Um, so one of them might strike. It's in the first like five minutes of the video too. Uh, and actually one of them is Lewis. You guys who, especially those of you who just did Chem 222, you just did Lewis dot structures. This is Gilbert Lewis. He is the electron man. So we just defined acids and bases based on protons. Well, Gilbert Lewis looked at everything based on electrons. Um, and that was because the electron had just been discovered. So what he said is Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. And a Lewis base is an electron donor. 
So since he changed from protons to electrons, he also changed those pieces. Example of the base, NH3. Oh, we already knew nitrogen is a base because it has that lone pair. These electrons, instead of saying it's attracting the proton, which is how everybody else thinks about it, he's saying it's donating the electrons. It's still the same answer. If you see nitrogen, you're thinking base. Electron acceptor, the classic example is boron. Boring boron, I love boron. So BCL3. Do you guys remember when you did Lewis structures, this guy was the exception to the octet rule. Because of where boron is in the periodic table, boron can't make it to the octet. Boron doesn't go to eight, it only goes to eight. six electrons. So boron, we'll put the chlorines around, right? You give your chlorines their dots, however you learn to do this. And then boron just stops there. No double bond, it just stops. It has this empty spot here. So it has a place to accept the electrons. And then if you have nitrogen, it has that lone pair. Oh, look what's gonna happen. So that's what Gilbert Lewis saw. Um, and he changed how we drew molecules. It's only been less than 100 years that we've been able to draw molecules like we do, um, which is phenomenal. All right, next one, acid strength, comparing halogens. So halogens are what family? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, the seven eights. So if we look at fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, you increase the atomic radius as you move down the periodic table. I should have written this going up and down like it is on the periodic table. As you increase the atomic radius, the hydrogen ion is further away from the nucleus. From, it's like it doesn't know what's going on. So this is the strongest acid. When we put a hydrogen in front of it. And so HCl, HBr, and HI, they are actually all considered strong acids. You pull the hydrogen off very easily. HF is not a strong acid because it's so small. Um, it's actually hard to pull that hydrogen off. All right, that was really brief and quick. You can always look it up if you want more explanation. And then there's something called the inductive effect. I never remember that term unless I have it written down. Um, as you add more oxygens, you increase the acidity. And that has to do with, I actually talked about it yesterday and today uh, with the organic acids. It's when they have the CO2H, that double oxygen. The oxygens are so greedy. Um, my example here is sulfuric acid is a stronger acid than H2SO3 because you have four oxygens versus three. In fact, H2SO4 is a strong acid. So more oxygens always makes it a stronger acid. All right, and then last thing we have to do, I referred to this earlier, so it's actually a really simple question. You should be able to do I know I'm out of focus, but you guys all have it in front of you. So this would be given to you as a little chart. These are Ka values. And it would ask you, which has the lowest pH, which has, it will ask you questions about it. So looking at these three Ka values, which one is the strongest acid of the three? Before we look at my three questions, which of these three is the strongest acid, and how do you know? Is it HNO2? 
the middle one is our strongest because it has the largest Ka. So you're looking at the, they're negative exponents, so negative four is the largest Ka. They're all weak acids, so they all are two-way reactions, but um, the HNO2 in this example is our strongest one. So that allows us, oh, actually, here we go. Which one is the weakest of the three? The HCN, because it has the lowest. So this is going to be our weakest, because it has the lowest Ka. So we're never going to pick Hockel in this example because it's in the middle. It's always going to ask you for either the highest or the lowest. So which one has the lowest pH? Well, as you increase acidity, what happens to pH? pH drops. It goes down. It's because it's a negative log. That was Soren Sorensen. Again, nobody has picked him. He came up with this idea of a pH scale. I don't know why he made it a negative log. Uh, Dr. Gibbs also, when we get into free energy, it's going to drive some of you crazy because negativity, we're going to be looking at negatives. But the lower the pH, the more acidic, the strongest acid is going to have the lowest pH. So the HNO2, because it is the strongest, because it has the highest Ka. So let's say this was on your midterm, it was a show your work question, and I just asked you to explain. You don't have to be grammatically correct. You would just say HNO2, highest Ka, most acidic, lowest pH. All right. This chart, it goes from the strongest acid to the weakest. An interesting thing happens. The conjugate bases go the other way. The stronger an acid, so the answer for B, the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. You can say that also for bases and conjugate acids. It has to do, the reason for that has to do with the formula Ka times Kb always equals 10 to negative 14. So as Ka goes up, Kb has to go down. So the answer, the strongest conjugate base is the weakest. So it's HCM. All right. Oh, there we go, pKa. What's the little P stand for? Negative log. PKA is the negative log of the KA. Anytime you see a little P, means negative log. So this is a big conceptual thing. This last problem is really important. It shows up on our practice test again, which means it's gonna be on your test. It's also on the final. Good news on the final is you won't have to explain anything. Um, I first want to talk about pH. And when you see it with pH, then you'll have it always. So pH is the negative log of the hydronium. As you increase your hydronium, you increase your acidity. what's going to happen to pH? If you have more hydronium, your pH is going to go lower. It's that negative in front of the log that Soren Sorensen put in there. So which one's going to have the lowest pKa? What's going to be the relationship between Ka and pKa? Again, it's going to be an opposite effect. The lowest pKa is going to be the highest Ka. The 
because it's a negative log. So that would have been my HNO2. I'm going to stop recording unless somebody has a major question I think everybody would benefit from. And then I can hang out and answer other questions you might have. <laughs>